Uh, it was a busy year in the budget season, and three bills came out affecting the criminal justice system that uh, we need to go over. Now, one had to do with custodial interrogation, one with photo pack identifications, and one very big one impacting the way we're going to do juvenile justice moving forward. But today, all I'm going to be talking about, at least for purposes of this webcast, is how the laws with respect to photo pack identifications have changed. Now, to get involved here, this had to do with a uh, project for conviction integrity. And you're going to hear the phrase blind or blinded a lot, so we're going to talk about that right up front. The concern for a long time was that if law enforcement had a photograph of you, you must have done something wrong. And therefore, for the jury to hear about a photo pack identification could be deemed prejudicial. This logic went by the wayside a long time ago in basically every other state but New York, as everybody became aware that DMV photos exist and lots of other photographic identification photos exist that don't involve mug shots. However, New York was lagging behind. It was time for a correction. This correction, however, came with some conditions. So starting July 1 of this year, 2017, photo pack arrays are finally going to be allowed into evidence. However, unlike the other 49 states, we have some preconditions, and they do involve procedural safeguards for conviction integrity purposes. So, enter the phrase blind or blinded. Now, a blind or blinded procedure is one by law enforcement in which a witness identifies a person in a photo array under circumstances where at the time the identification was made, the public servant or the detective or the prosecutor, but the public servant administering the procedure doesn't know who the suspect is, that is blind, or doesn't know where the suspect is, which is blinded. Now, as far as the modifications for this, it's actually going to be in statutory law codified in the Criminal Procedure Law, Section 6025 and 6030. Um, for a long time, we've all had the problem of having a witness on the stand and prepping them not to talk about the photo array. Now, hopefully that can go away if everybody, the court system, the prosecutors, and the uh, detectives are on board with the blind or blinded procedures. And again, the purpose behind the blind or blind procedures is to have enhanced safeguards against wrongful identifications. By not having the detective know who or where the subject of the investigation is, there's less of a chance of any sort of corruption of that identification procedure. So while yes, of course, it does go to suggestivity for constitutional purposes, mostly it's designed for an additional layer of protection for conviction integrity purposes. Okay, so let's walk through what actually happens with a witness. The witness in a blind or blinded photo identification procedure who has been uh, subject to one of those and makes an identification can now talk about that procedure on the stand. Let's see how that plays out. If the witness testifies, I observed the defendant at the daytime place of occurrence or place of incident, and then says I can identify the defendant right now in court, that's great. That's what we have right now. That's our system. You add now a blind or blinded procedure the witness for the first time in New York State history can now say I also picked out that defendant from a bunch of photos right after that thing happened. Yep, those photos right there. You can even, besides the testimony regarding the procedure, introduce the actual photo array into evidence as evidence in chief. And the additional bonus of this, well that's good in and of itself because it was an awkward prep session for every witness and uh, unnatural, I think, even for juries who didn't know about that intermediate step. Here's a, a dynamite uh, proposition for it. Even if the witness testifies that I observed the defendant at the date, time, place of incident, I got a good luck, but I, it's been so long I can't tell you who the defendant is anymore. If there was a blind or blinded identification procedure, the witness can talk about it and say, but I know I was right when I picked the defendant out to the police way back when, and a detective can be called to talk about that procedure, introduce the photo array, and you still have a case. Now, always the question is what happens when you don't 
do it blind or blinded. What is the penalty? What is the sanction under the CPL now? Well, after a long legislative fight over this, uh, over this specific amendment to the CPL, the remedy is simply the witness can't talk. That's it. There's no bearing on, on suggestivity for weight hearing purposes for failure to do blind or blinded. The idea about doing blind or blinded procedures is supposed to be, it's an incentive for law enforcement to do it this way because then we can use it for evidence which we haven't been able to do before. Everybody is afraid of this getting conflated down the line with suggestivity. If you look at the amendments themselves, they are very clear, uh, very clear that this is not to be considered by any court for an issue of suppression. It is only to be considered for an issue of trial disability. So without the blind or blinded, your consequence is you gagged your witness and you have to go again through that awkward prep where you say, don't talk about this ID, but if they talk about it, then maybe you could talk about it, always tell the truth, and your witnesses always get very jumbled over that situation, and it's really just not the best, uh, it hasn't been the best situation, and we're glad that it's being remedied. Now, how are we doing things in Nassau County? So, first and foremost, the Nassau County Police Department, in response to this law, is amending their uh, worksheet forms that you've seen in circulation for a long time uh, to include a shuffle method and uh, using multiple envelopes instead of just one envelope. This, I will go into detail on this. This actually came from what came from the Municipal Police Training Council in June 2017, just very recent. Under the same law that, that allowed all this to happen, this uh, MPTC, this uh, state body, was uh, directed to promulgate new procedures to uh, go along with the change and make a model policy for how to do a photo array. And what they settled on, on page five of that policy is, is right here in front of you now. For blind, when you don't know who the suspect is, it's what we'll call the two-person shuffle up top where somebody other than the administrator uh, you know, does, uh, does the creation or even the showing. Uh, if they do the creation and the showing, it's truly blind. Uh, if the uh, detective who has uh, involvement with the investigation, though, uh, wants to be blinded, uh, can't find an extra body, uh, and just needs to be blinded from the uh, from knowledge of where the suspect is in the uh, photo array. You can do one of these methods, the two-person shuffle, where uh, yeah, the somebody other than the administrator uh, creates the array and, and gives an unmarked folder, and then the uh, administrator just passes it over to the witness, not knowing where um, the person who made the array uh, put the subject. But the more likely thing is what's going to be called the one-person shuffle, so let's focus in on that. That's actually what's being adopted by our local uh, police department, and it's pretty much uh, right in line here with the model policy. So here's actually pretty simple. Instead of one photo array being pre uh, prepared, you're going to have three prepared. They're going to be the exact same fillers. You're just going to have uh, the subject in a different position in each uh, photo array. They could be in position 1, 4, 7, well, not 1, 4, 7, but 1, 4, 6, 1, 4, 5, 2, 3, 5, whatever combination you're going to really have there. Uh, the, the detective who's going to do the procedure can know about that, of course, but what's going to happen is they're putting those three different photo arrays into three different manila folders. The manila folders, which are unmarked, then go into sealed envelopes, also unmarked on the outside. Those sealed envelopes are shuffled in the presence of the witness, all three envelopes are given to the witness who will then sign or initial and date across the seal. Very important, it has to be across the seal. Uh, then they're going to select one and hand the two, right, uh, two uh, unused ones back to the uh, detective. They're going to break the seal on just the one they've selected and they're going to conduct the photo array uh, from there. What this has done is the detective who is uh, conducting the array and providing the instructions and supervising the, the uh, identification proceeding will not know which of the three arrays that he or she prepared the witness is looking at. So again, that, that blinds them to the where the sus uh, subject is and uh, allows for that uh, conviction integrity uh, protection that, uh, that this law was aiming to uh, seek out. So that's how the Nassau County PD is going to change their protocols very shortly. 
How the courts are going to deal with this is uh, there's not going to be a statewide announcement uh, on exactly how to handle this in court. I can tell you that they have uh, circulated this criminal justice or criminal jury instruction uh, throughout the state. This has to do more, again, with what we talked about at the beginning where uh, there's a limiting instruction to the jury that they're not supposed to infer that the fact that the police had a photo of the defendant meant he's guilty. It goes back to that suspicion that uh, if the police have a photo of you, you must have done something wrong. So you're, you're going to start seeing or requesting a charge conference this instruction. Okay, so the big question is what, is what are our obligations to prosecutors here? And for this, the District Attorneys Association got together and worked out a bunch of different procedures to um, tackle uh, a uniform approach to in-court in litigation. Now, it starts with the 71030 notice. Now, my hunch is that right now we are serving 71030. We intend to uh, use a photo pack ID at trial. Now, it's going to mean something a lot different now with these amendments to the CPL. Um, before, as we were, we, you know, the notice of ID had limited merit because you couldn't actually introduce the photo array into evidence, you couldn't talk about it. Now you can, and so that 71031B notice is going to have a whole new impact. But for our purposes, consistent with what we're doing currently, we're serving notice of our intention to use it at trial. So that's notice one to defense counsel in court. The Wade hearing is going to happen, uh, usually does. Uh, however, one thing that uh, you got to note again is while we're proving at the Wade hearing that the identification procedure was not unnecessarily suggestive, the goal here is to prevent, prevent, prevent the blind or blinded from becoming a sole issue on which that Wade hearing is determined. Okay? We're obviously going to have to be talking about the way the identification procedure was conducted. The blind or blinded is going to come into that. That methodology is going to be part of what we're talking about in the normal course of getting the testimony out of the detective. And at the end, it's going to help you, because at the end, you would think that with the blind or blinded methodology, it is linked, essentially, to uh, the suggestivity, because how could it be suggestive if the uh, detective was blind or blinded, and the witness was in control of their uh, uh, photo arrays that they selected? So it will come out. However, let's, uh, let's all remember during any arguments to uh, really be careful. Let's not hang our hat on blind or blinded. If it doesn't, if it didn't happen, let's all remember that there's always a possibility that you have cases where this doesn't happen, and it should not become a culture where suggestivity is linked to this trial admissibility rule. Okay? And there's, again, a language in the statute, 6025 and 6030, that will specifically and explicitly state that this has nothing to do with suggestivity, cannot be considered for a suggestivity motion. If anybody does get a motion from a defense counsel, even coming close to that, uh, we'll have a form motion response uh, ready to go. After the Wade hearing uh, occurs, provided that the evidence was not suppressed, we're going to order the minutes, as we do anyway, uh, you know, for Rosario purposes. But one of the things now is the, that those minutes are going to uh, demonstrate that the photo array was conducted in a blind or blinded way. Now always remember, I'm going to say at this point, the uh, police agency always has the option, if they can, to do things blind. They always have the option of having somebody completely unconnected with the, the case being the one who displays the array, who has no idea who the subject is. However, we know that's going to be more cumbersome, that requires an extra body, requires extra witnesses, requires possibly o overtime money. So I would count more often on blinded being the, the, the methodology that comes across your desk. Now we're at prelim, uh, prelims or preliminaries. Uh, during the housekeeping matters, uh, we're going to be mentioning, mentioning, not motioning, but mentioning that we intend to use the photo array at trial. You're putting the defense counsel essentially on notice a second time. If the defense counsel wants to make a motion to preclude, that's on them. But what we're going to be doing is following a proper foundation at trial, and that's how we're going to put the array in. Now, you can imagine as this rolls out at the beginning, the um, various judges, not just in our county, but across the state, are going to have different varieties of approaches uh, to the mechanics. Um, the foundational questions are, are pretty straightforward. But if we have already uh, documented minutes of how the proceeding happened, and uh, we are, have a good faith basis to proceed with a line of questioning about getting it into trial, 
then that is going to be determined not unlike any other evidentiary matter right at trial, okay? At trial, of course, after you deal with the preliminaries, uh, pending, you know, that you've put in all the notices you have been able to put in, uh, when the detective's on the stand, you're going to lay the foundation for the introduction of the array, demonstrating that the array was shown blind or blinded. To avoid any troll bridge problem, the array should not be shown to the jury until the foundation has been laid and the witness has testified. Now, it is possible to have the witness entirely of themselves lay their own foundation. It may be beneficial, however, to have the detective testify to the proceeding as well. Uh, I, when I say that, I mean the safeguards. I think it's uh, impactful for a jury to hear the safeguards. It will strengthen your case. Not always legally required foundationally, but as far as a matter of tactics, it, it, it it's, could be a very valuable um, piece of testimony, uh, very valuable for the trier of fact. Okay, the effective date of this law starts July 1, 2017, which means if there are any blind or blinded procedures that have already happened starting that date, they can be admitted at trial. Um, a lot of the police departments around the state have been attempting to comport their protocols as with the our, our police department. Um, trying to update the protocols to make sure that in the future these do get uh, it, uh, eligible for admission. Uh, you can imagine that if they're starting now, the litigation uh, track of those cases or those identifications will put us somewhere into the fall or the winter. So while it's not immediately anticipated that, uh, that uh, these uh, photo arrays are going to be put into trial immediately, it's possible. If you do have a blind or blinded procedure by accident or by some very safeguarded procedure before, uh, starting July 1, 2017, those are admissible and you can get them in. All right. That's going to be it for this segment. We will pick it up with juvenile justice and custodial interrogation next time.